Hey, Shoshan. Morning. How are you? How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Okay. A bit nervous. <laughs> it's a oh, typically oh. a huge turn now for for the for this talk oh. now. Uh, don't be nervous. It'll be great. I'm looking forward to hearing your talk. Um, do you want to check? Yep. Test out your Let slides. Me... Sure. Let me try. Yeah, you can see the sky, right? Yeah, it looks great. Let me see. Should be fine. I don't have movie here, so hopefully it should be OK. Yeah. I feel like all of you Don Cleveland guys have similar slide styles. <laughs> well, we want the style is I think I still more from Magda. Like this of, part? But, like yeah. this, like curved the, things there and stuff like that. Right, right. We yeah, labels. I guess we learn from each other if you put it that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Magda and Cotillo has beautiful slides, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the other speaker is here also. Is it? Okay, hi Ning. Hey, hi, Ning. Good hey. to see you. Yeah. Hear me okay? Yeah, great. Thanks for coming. Yeah, definitely. Like, thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, oh, can you thanks. test out your slides? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, You see it? Looks great. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, look looks everything good. Looks great, yeah. Yeah. Okay. How are you guys doing? We are pretty good. Uh, how are you? Like, oh good. We're um uh, we're in Shanghai. Yeah, I uh, I know. So that's why I'm asking. So like that, yeah, the news already made to CNN, right? Oh, of of what me going to China or no, 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 you going to China, but about the uh, the uh, the viral virus situation. So like there are certain like uh, uh, the the cases arising in those. Yeah, I think it's important to put it in perspective. There were forty cases in Shanghai yesterday, and there are twenty six million people in the city. Yeah, over I uh, I know like uh, the case rate compared to U.S. like uh, that's nothing, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, the pro, I guess uh, like the reaction is uh, is strong. The reaction and the procedure, kind yeah. of. So they, yeah. and areas and all that. They closed all schools. All all schools in Shanghai are closed. I see. So like, uh, but uh, how how would the institute like uh, can can you go to work and all that? Yeah. Um, I um, work, so I, I'm just, anyway, yeah, the Institute for Neuroscience is open and things. Um, I can visit places, but other I universities are, are tighter. Yeah, yeah, or, or of course, like, a, yeah, you are, you are still working in the U.S., like your lab still yeah, working. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. No, I'm just at my, in my apartment in Shanghai, just doing work, writing papers and things. Okay. Yeah, great, yeah. Uh, weather is great in Shanghai. Um, it's, yeah. it's really nice here. Yeah, we just uh, leave for like uh, the uh, the mask mandate like uh, this uh, past weekend, like uh, and yeah, Oregon yeah. one of the latest states. So, but I saw if you look at Europe, like their cases are coming back up again. So I bet in a, maybe two or three weeks it'll be back up again in yeah. America. Yeah, right now like uh, it's uh, uh, it still look good, but looking at some of the Europe. Uh, uh, European data. I, I think like that's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, but it it really feels uh, a little bit funny. Because today like it's uh, like uh, for the 
for the first working day that like uh, in our industry, like uh, people can technically allow not to wear mask, but uh, mm -hmm. still like, uh, and, and you can see people are hesitating like uh, to take off the mask. Many, yeah. many, most people still wear it, but there are a, a couple, uh, like a few, like uh, start taking them off. Hey. Yeah. Hello. Hey, honey. Hey. Nice. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Uh, hi. Chen. Hello. Hi. Hi, John. Hi. You're at home, John? Yeah, I'm at home. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I want to see all this furniture you have. Like every time we try to go out to the bar, you're always saying like, "Oh, I'm getting furniture." <laughs> you must have tons of furniture. Yeah, this is why I stay all the home. So all, the new home is still under under development. So. <laughs> oh, cool. Where's your new so work on it? Uh, uh, Songjiang. It's uh, like uh, oh, wow. say, uh, twenty twenty miles away. Yes. Yeah. Uh, a little bit. It's Never... towards Hangzhou. Is it closer to Hangzhou? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. On on the way to Hangzhou. Yeah. Cool. Are there good schools out there? Yeah. Uh, kind of the uh, university town out there. So I'm trying still... to. Sorry. Go ahead, Heidi. Songjiang uh, is still part of Shanghai, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. There's, there's mm -hmm. a, lot, a, lot, a lot of people uh, buy department uh, apartment there because it's housing prices uh, is in, uh, in the, the downtown is so expensive. So a lot of PI in Iowa actually bought a house out there. Uh, it's far, it'll be far. So. I, I heard they're encouraging the universities to move out there from, yeah. like, from the downtown. So that's probably right. The they next. even encourage, encourage Iowa to move to uh, somewhere else, outside the, the city. It, is that going to work? I don't know. Um, yeah, they have some plans. So I will have some. Uh, actually, I will has a, a monkey facility in Songjiang. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, like uh, hundreds of monkeys over there. Is wow. Logothetis there now? Is he is he here now? Logothetis. Who? Logothetis. Nico Logothetis. Uh, yeah, I believe he he's here right he, now already. Uh, yeah. Okay. But right he's now. not. He's in Songjiang, or is he in? In Songjiang. Songjiang. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The new the new facility, yeah. Okay. So yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. How about you guys, Shuachen? Are you how are things in Singapore? I think it's getting better. Uh, the the government said the the wave is gone, so now the number is coming down, and I think the government is doing living with COVID, so they don't. I don't think they care. <laughs> anymore <laughs> so everything is open and more or less open and then if you are positive you basically just stay home unless it's uh, very severe so mm -hmm. i think we'll hopefully we'll be fine i mean singapore is small they probably cannot be isolated from the rest of the world so they they really want to connect mm -hmm. so yeah, hopefully can can really invite uh, everyone to singapore is there any travel restriction to Singapore or or this not? They now have this uh, vaccine travel land. So basically, the, a few countries, I think US is one. Uh, you can come in, if you're vaccinated, you come in and then they give you an uh, antigen test, rapid test. If you're, I think if you're negative, you just come in. There's no really no restrictions. Um, so, hello, is she? Hi, is she? Hi, Jin. Are you being quarantined or separated? Uh, no, but all the schools here in in Shanghai are closed. Yeah, oh, really? we're, we're kind kind of kind of more or less quarantined. Yeah. Oh. Half of my lab is can, cannot go to lab, go to work. Oh. Quarantine at home. That's true. Although they are not top positive at all. <laughs> Uh, but I was just saying, to put it in perspective, I think there were 40 new cases, 100 asymptomatic infections yesterday, but there's 26 million people in the city. Uh, so I, 
and, and then I think most of the, almost every one of those cases were found in quarant people in quarantine. So they're really good here at contact tracing. Yeah. It's, it's pretty yeah. amazing how they, how they can get uh, them. Actually, I, symptoms are very mild, even positive ones. They ne I've never heard of like severe, severe types. So I think it's fine, right? It's after that. No, but the out. problem is like had the CDC head in <laughs> Shanghai get, get, got fired and the Shenzhen one, and then they hire new ones and then they want to do like double the effort and then it's oh, a more yeah, 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 yeah. They don't want to get fired. I think that's a little bit uh, tricky. Yeah. yeah. Like at my, I have like this really nice compound we live in and then there's like a fancy pool and all this stuff and gym and they just decided to close it through no, uh, no yeah. real reason. They just said, all right, we're going to fight the epidemic. We're going to close this, but it didn't really make sense. And then like yeah. my deliver, I order like takeout delivery. So a guy in scooter comes to my door, del delivers whatever food I want. But now mm -hmm. they said they're going to not let it into the compound. You have to go out. Oh, like, uh, yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah, right, get it. Oh. Yeah, they do that. Yeah. Hey, Hai Ning. Hey, Kang. Hey. Very good to see you. Long time no see, yeah. Yeah. How, how's your uh, piano progress? <laughs> My piano, <laughs> I kind of stopped. Yeah, I actually stopped for quite a few years. Uh, there was a, uh, like, uh, there was uh, one year that my, uh, uh, my nephew like uh, come in uh, and then like uh, to uh, and then like uh, live with us like for another for a year and then so then both he and my son uh, for you guys like who don't know like I I I spend some time learning piano together with my son but then like uh, when my son's cousin comes in and then like uh, then it becomes three person learning piano the time that take too long for each your piano. son is um, your music piano teacher no 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 like he, like uh, when he was when he was a kid like he, he like uh, in can't like uh, uh, know him probably like when last time when Kang Sin probably was still very young, uh, and now now he's a high school. Uh, I was just very impressed by Hai Ning's determination to learn the piano. <laughs> yeah, I I I was determined to get to level four, in her, but but I think like I I uh, at that point like I I, I stopped probably roughly at level two, and then but I uh, I have another one. The good thing is. Uh, so he's going to start his piano, like uh, hopefully sometime this year. And then like uh, I get to restart my journey. Cool. All right, maybe uh, so we'll that get yeah, started. Sorry. Great, mm -hmm. okay. Hi everyone, welcome to uh, Daylight Saving Time edition of NeuroZoom. Um, 8 a.m. in China. If it's a little bit too early for you, we always have the the YouTube option, so subscribe and like the channel, and you can uh, you can see the website on the or you can see the YouTube channel on the website. Before we get started with uh, Shua Chan and Hai Ning's talks, let me just remind you that next week we have two great speakers, Xia Jing Tong from Shanghai Tech University, just down the block from me, and uh, Ruby Chan from Academia Seneca, or we'll be talking. So tune in, and then remember in Asia one hour earlier. Okay, uh, Zalan, do you want to introduce Heidi? Sure, 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 great. Okay, it's my great pleasure to introduce the uh, great colleague of my, uh, uh, Hanin Zhong. So Hanin has got his uh, um, bachelor's degree from uh, Tsinghua University again. So as uh, uh, we have a lot of colleagues from Tsinghua. Uh, now, uh, after a uh, bachelor's degree, he went to uh, Dust Hopkins, uh, working with uh, a Ding Wei Yu, uh, Yu Jingwei, who okay, has uh, become a supreme uh, electric physiologist working on, uh, uh, working on uh, ion channels in retina. But after PhD in Hopkins, uh, he went to uh, working with the uh, Carlos Voda. So starting with uh, coding, coding Swing Hover, then moved to a genetic form where I met, I met him. I uh, met a couple uh, in the uh, uh, TNE and, and genetic form. By the time I went, uh, at the time I decided to uh, left US for Shanghai. So, so I, in, uh, in uh, Soboda's lab, as the Hainin has developed a supreme imaging tool to imaging the PK8 activity in the uh, synaptic plasticity. And uh, after, after postdoc, he and uh, Tian Yi uh, went to uh, Wallum Institute to start their own labs and uh, uh, continue uh, for Hainin, I believe, uh, continue working for because all kinds of fancy tools um, uh, to imaging all kinds of uh, neural activity in single uh, molecular level. Now today, uh, Hanin will talk about his latest to working on uh, in vivo imaging of neuromodulatory signaling. Okay, so welcome Hanin, take it away. Yeah, 
Thank you, Zhong. Uh, okay. Right. Yeah, full screen. Yeah, I'm trying to, it's a long to do it. Okay, do you see a full screen? Yeah, go ahead. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Aaron and Zhong for putting this wonderful seminar series, and really thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Like Zhong introduced, like my lab, I uh, generally use uh, microscopy methods to study uh, uh, brain uh, neuronal plasticity and also the uh, regulation of neuronal function, like uh, in the brain in the now in the context of animal behavior, typically. And uh, for today, I will tell you some of our recent effort try to study the intracellular signaling mechanisms underlying neuromodulation, or, or uh, again in the context of uh, animal behavior. So this uh, give you um, some a uh, big picture view of uh, where we come from. Uh, the brain is like a collection of precisely wide neuronal circuit. But if one thing about one actually don't want this brain circuit to be active all the time. And energy is like in a cancer hall, there is a very complex electric circuit, but an indispensable piece of equipment is actually a regular panel that allow a DJ to control uh, the, uh, the on and off, and then also the gain of individual circuits. And similarly in our brain, there's also mechanism that allow, one, uh, allow it to control like how, which in our brain circuit is engaged and then what's the gain of the circuit. And that's what we are interested in. This is some approximation. Uh, the brain can be, <clears throat> sorry, the precise brain circuit uh, is mediated by a fast synaptic transmission pathway like uh, in the brain. Yeah, yeah uh, and then uh, this is such as those mediated by glutamate and GABA, they work on inotropic receptors and directly regulate neuronal electric activity, action potential and calcium dynamics. And the DJ in our brain uh, is uh, mediated by a slower pathway, also called neuromodulatory pathway. External uh, extracellular neuromodulator such as norepinephrine, dopamine, acetylcholine, uh, and serotonin and a variety of new peptides. They work on metabotropic receptors, most typically dupin couple receptors to regulate intracellular signaling activity. And from there, there can be many effectors and among them, like uh, if they impose very powerful control over the fast uh, transmission pathway by regulating neuronal excitability, synaptic transmission and neuronal plasticity. Always like to understand the brain, we need to, we want to be able to examine all these different activities. And uh, over the years, a lot of effort has been put in to develop sensors that allow the imaging of all these uh, different activities uh, in vivo in the context of animal behavior. And particularly for the new modulatory pathway, uh, the breakthrough really only happened in the past few years. And many of you probably have heard of the grab series and light series of new modulator sensors that allow one to monitor increasing number of new modulator in vivo. And my lab work on the complementary aspect. We work to uh, taking the imaging of intracellular signaling pathways such as those mediated by PKMP, PK and PKC uh, to, uh, for in vivo imaging somewhat analogous to in the tra fast transmission pathway that people image uh, calcium. So my lab has two phases, like we do two development, but we, our ultimate goal is to use these two to study biology. So for today's talk, like I will first tell you a couple of tools that we developed uh, that allow one to do uh, in vivo uh, PK and PsychMP imaging. Then I will tell you some of our uh, recent uh, interesting results that we arrive at uh, in the stratum by applying these tools. Okay, so this is so show you a zoom in view of the new modulator pathway. Currently, we now know that there are dozens of new modulator and each new modulator can uh, interact with uh, a number of different uh, re receptors. And so there are over there are hundreds of GPN couple receptors. But the good thing is that this uh, receptor all converge onto a small handful of intracellular signaling pathways. And in the context of, of uh, today's talk, uh, 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 in the context of today's talk, like uh, all, 
all the new modulators converge onto like a, a like the second P pathway, like either it directly or indirectly. And notably, like even the same new modulator, uh, they may work on different subtype of receptors and they can result in very different regulation and sometimes opposite regulation of the second P pathway. And in neurons, the uh, main uh, effect of second P is the second P dependent kinase, also called protein kinase or PKA. And over half a century of studies has uh, as established that this pathway regulates many, many different substrates and then it basically touch upon almost every single aspect of a neuronal function. What is lacking is that the ability to monitor this pathway in vivo so that there are a lot of open questions remains about when, where, and how this pathway participate in animal behavior. And that's where my lab tried to contribute. And our first success was uh, to image PK in vivo. We use a sensor called A kinase activity reporter or A car. Uh, this sensor, uh, like uh, at the resting state, adopt a loose configuration, but it can change it to a close uh, configuration upon phosphorylation by PKA. Uh, and this uh, puts the two flow of force at the two end of the sensor in this uh, illustrating example, GAP and RP close to one another. And so that there is a thread going on between the two fluorescent protein. Uh, what Fred does is that like, uh, when the GAP is excited, part of its energy can directly transmit to RFP without emitting a photon. And this result in a decrease in the GAP fluorescence and the corresponding increase in RP fluorescence. And by measuring Fred, one can estimate the sensor activity. Uh, as cited, like, uh, we are not the original in, uh, inventor of this sensor. The sensor has been around for over two decades. but uh, but uh, when we start, people really has not been able to take this series of sensor or its uh, improved variants to in vivo. And to overcome the problem, we decided to use a somewhat uh, less conventional microscopy called photon fluorescent lifetime imaging microscopy uh, to measure this sensor, which uh, as I'm going to show you in the next couple slides, that has a lot of advantage. First, let me tell you what is a lifetime imaging. So uh, when a uh, fluorophore, such as a donor fluorophore in a flat pair, is excited. Uh, it will stay at the excited state on average for a few nanoseconds before it comes back to the ground state and emit a photon. And this a few nanoseconds is called the lifetime of the fluorophore. The way to measure it, uh, if one excite a bunch of fluorophore instantaneously at time zero and then follow the subsequent fluorescent decay over the next few nanoseconds, one get a uh, single exponential decay and the time constant correspond to the fluorescent lifetime. Probably a little bit differently in the semi log scale, this give a single straight line. In the presence of thread, it basically provide another dream for the high energy state, this correspond to a short lifetime. And in a real biological sample, Crawford one has a mixture of a donor only and donor plus acceptors. This result in a curve somewhere in between and by fitting the curve, with a combination of two exponentials, one can actually quantify the relative percentage, like a, a win the mix. Uh, this together with the other uh, property of lifetime imaging made the lifetime imaging a uh, more quantitative compared to the more conventional measure of threat, such as uh, racial imaging. And lifetime imaging also has additional advantages, as well for in vivo imaging. Uh, as we know that the brain uh, is a highly light scattering tissue and it will scatter different wavelengths like differently. So if one measure a thread like using racial imaging as one go deeper and deeper into the brain, the signal will just keep changing. Lifetime is a property that is independent of light scattering. Uh, uh, and as a result, the lifetime measurement is stable. Uh, the lifetime measurement also uh, only really care about the donor fluorescence. So therefore, it, uh, instead of using a red fluorescent protein as the acceptor, one can actually use a dark fluorescent protein as the acceptor. A dark fluorescent protein is something that can absorb but cannot emit. This will free up a color ch channel that allow one to easily do multiplex imaging. For example, in this uh, example, like uh, in the green channel, like uh, we were able to do PK imaging and in the very same cell along the dash line, we were able to use a red genetically encoded calcium indicator to do calcium imaging. Overall lifetime uh, imaging has a lot of combined strengths and, and extra 
uh, compared to both single flow for imaging and rheumatic imaging. And we really hope that like uh, this micro micro modality will become more and more popular in neuroscience over the next uh, years. So uh, the microscopy set, we also work on the sensor. Uh, on the sensor front, like we did two things. First, like we come collect all the lifetime PK sensor at that time, and we compare their performance. And this is uh, important because as you can see, like the sensor performance vary uh, quite drastically. And turns out that this purple sensor, the Flim A car developed by Bernardo Sabatini, uh, like uh, really outperform all the other alternative sensors. But even for this sensor, it wasn't quite enough for in raw imaging. So we wonder whether we can further improve it. And in work that like uh, I won't have time to go into, but that's a part of my lab work on it. We know that the PK does not distribute evenly in neurons. Uh, the PK shown green here is relatively exclude from dendritic spines at the resting state. And we know that this is because they are anchored to micro microtubular cytoskeleton uh, on the dendritic shaft. PK only go into dendritic spines uh, upon activation and become associated with the plasma membrane as well. Knowing this, we uh, made a simple hypothesis that if we take a sensor and put it to where there are a lot of PK molecule, either at the resting state or when PK is activated, maybe we can uh, improve the sensor performance. And turns out that uh, this work, like when we tag the sensor to microtubule, we call this a target, ACA and ARF designate for uh, microtubule targeting. The sensor performance was greatly enhanced and it's really like uh, for the physiological stimulant, no uh, epinephrine, the performance enhanced by uh, almost threefold. We did a fair amount of calculation for this new variant of sensor and here shows you a couple of them. In this uh, experiment, we compare uh, the, our sensor with uh, a slow after hyperpression, which is electrical uh, 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 electrophysiologically measurable neuronal property that control neuronal excitability. And it's also known that the uh, uh, SAHP can be regulated by norepinephrine in a PK dependent manner. And we found that our sensor and this physiological readout basically like, uh, are regulated by norepinephrine at about comparable sensitivity as well as uh, comparable kinetics. This together with other calculation that I won't uh, go into, uh, give us the confidence to take the sensor in vivo. So the experiment was quite easy, pretty much worked the first time and on the left is intensity image and on the right is the PK activity image. We can see individual neurons like a with a high contrast and uh, also achieve subcellular re resolution as well. In our uh, initial study, like uh, what we found is that in the cortical uh, layer two, three pyramidal neurons, there's already a base tonic level of PK activity uh, that's associated with uh, animal wakefulness. And we can also bidirectionally manipulate this uh, PK activity by manipulating uh, like a uh, different uh, new modulator receptor pathways. We also found that animal behavior such as uh, locomotion can elicit PK activity that's uh, heterogeneous across different neurons. For example, these two neurons, like they look somewhat similar to each other. However, when the animal runs, only one of them exhibits like a high PK activity. So, uh, so this far I tell you about our work like on in, in imaging of PK. But for uh, some labs, they are more interested in PsychMP. Uh, this is because the PsychMP is one stream, uh, one step for the upstream. And then uh, not all PsychMP function is uh, mediated via, uh, via PKA and also PsychMP is a small molecule, so it may have different properties. So uh, in the next couple of slides, I will show some of our more recent effort, try, also try to take PsychMP imaging in vivo. Again, we start by comparing the existing sensor. There has been uh, about 50 different PsychMP sensor that has been published over a couple of decades. Uh, we, uh, we systematically compare a of the most promising one including both the fresh sensors and intensity sensors. We end up like this blue one that was originally developed by Kisi Ling at Netherlands for its consistency like a, 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 in response across trials and then also for its large dynamic range. But this sensor has a, a, a limitation in that its response to 
physiological stimulant such as norepinephrine was uh, pretty small, suggesting that its sensitivity was not quite enough. And to improve its sensitivity, we use a structure guided mutagenesis approach. We better look at how the PsychMP shown here, how it binds to the PsychMP binding pocket in the sensor. And we uh, rely on hypothesis and combine with mutagenesis. We derive in three different improved variants that we call PsychMP for us an imaging reporter based on EPAC or abbreviated as a CAM file. And the L, M, and H uh, designate for low, medium, and high um, uh, affinities. And as you can see, like compared to a parental sensor in 23 cells, the high affinity sensor increased the, uh, the sensitivity to norepinephrine stimulation by over 100 folds, depending on this uh, log scale. We'll, we also did uh, other improvement on this sensor and do extensive calibration uh, that I won't have time to go into, but please check out our preprint. But at the end of the day, like all this improvement allow us to take the sensor in vivo. And again, in a animal locomotion paradigm, we, we observe a very heterogeneous uh, response to PsychMP. And this uh, time like it's, uh, uh, we have preliminary results and it's uh, also brain region specific. Uh, they're like a, uh, in some brain region, like a most of the neuron, like a portal response to animal locomotion. Like a, there are sometimes, there are always neurons that don't respond, but there are also uh, sometimes we can find neurons that very strongly negatively respond uh, to animal locomotion. So a uh, brief summary of what I have told you this far, like a, uh, for us, lifetime imaging together with improve the sensor now enable us to do in vivo PsychMP and PK imaging. And uh, we also want to emphasize that like uh, we realize that many labs does not yet have the lifetime imaging uh, capability. We also have intensity ratio metric based options available and please feel free to contact us if you feel interested. And in the remaining time, I'll, I will quickly uh, touch upon our Real results like when we apply these tools in the striatum and studying how the new modulation uh, kind of will take place there. When talking about new modulation, striatum is a big place and one of the major new modulator there is uh, dopamine. And it's also very well known that if one lose dopamine in the striatum, one will get Parkinson's disease, which is a movement disorder. The striatum function and, uh, and its regulation has been a very extensive study like by a lot of labs and this really is only a small part of it. And uh, to summarize, in a very simplified way to summarizing it, the striatum, the 95% of striatal neurons are striatal projection neurons or SPNs. Uh, and they fall into two different categories. Uh, the half of the neuron is in the direct pathway that promotes movement and the other half uh, neurons are in a indirect pathway that inhibit movement. And the consensus of the few uh, things that like uh, when the animal want to move, one of the key event is that like uh, there's a dopamine release in the striatum. The dopamine will increase PKA in the direct pathway neurons via the D1 dopamine receptors that selectively express in these neurons. And dopamine will also suppress PKA like in the indirect pathway neurons via the D2 dopamine receptors. This model uh, is very well accepted, but it was also largely based on in vitro data. So since we can do in vivo PK imaging, so we decided to test out this model. And this shows uh, our experiment paradigm. We use a green lens that is uh, like a needle allows us to pull relative deep into the brain and, uh, and, uh, and measure uh, an image in the striatum. And we use a head fixed animal locomotion paradigm, allow the mouse to rest around and we can control the speed if needed. And this shows a representative a neuronal response. In this case, like we force the animal to run and you can see whenever animal runs in this uh, uh, striatal uh, neurons, like there's a big spike of PK activity. So uh, my postdoc Lei, like he has a whole study like uh, using this paradigm and uh, currently under revision. Uh, for the sake of time, I will only uh, show you a couple of the big surprises like we get from this study. And the first uh, surprise comes when we try to extract channel rhodopsin in the midbrain dopaminergic neurons 
so that we can use uh, optogenetics to release dopamine uh, in the striatum. And, and uh, this optogenetic stimulated dopamine release is on top of a tonic level of dopamine release that already happened. Uh, these dopaminergic neurons is known to fire at a, a tonic level of about one to three hertz. What they found <clears throat> was that in the direct pathway neurons, like uh, it's just as the, the model predicts uh, there's an increase of PK activity when we uh, trigger dopamine release. However, like uh, it's surprising that like uh, we didn't see anything like uh, when uh, in the indirect pathway neurons when we trigger dopamine release. And uh, the current model would predict that the dopamine would be decreased by dopamine release uh, in these neurons. And even a bigger surprise comes when we allow the animal to run. And in this case, we allow the animal to run voluntarily and then we align the animal uh, like uh, the, the the, uh, the measurements based on the animal running onset. We found that there's a big PK activity in both the direct pathway and indirect pathway neurons. Again, the PK activity in the direct pathway neuron can be explained by the model that's expected. However, uh, there's an, the current model completely failed to explain like a why like a PK activity would increase uh, like in the indirect pathway neuron. If anything, the model would predict that the PK activity decrease. We using pretty extensive uh, uh, pharmacology experiments. We found that the PK activity increase in direct pathway neuron in D was mediated by dopamine uh, uh, via the uh, D1 dopamine receptors. However, like a, a antagonizing neither D1 receptor nor D2 dopamine receptor can abolish like uh, the indirect pathway PK activity. And we end up found that it was mediated by the A2A adenosine receptor suggesting that there is a acute adenosine accumulation uh, under these circumstances. And taking advantage of the newly developed grab adenosine sensor from Yulong Li, uh, we found that like a, there's indeed, there's a, a, indeed a robust accumulation of uh, adenosine like a, when the animal is running. So uh, in the field, like a, for, for a long time, people already know that adenosine receptor is expressed in the striatum and plays function. But what people don't know is that like a when and where the adenosine is released and our result basically fills this gap. To wrap up, uh, basically like a, from, the, uh, from the previous uh, the, uh, model in the literature, like a, our results support uh, the, the current model prediction about the direct pathway uh, neurons. However, like for the indirect pathway, uh, like a, it's only half right in that like a, we show that an additional Dopamine release on top of the tonic level does not further decrease PK activity uh, in the indirect pathway neurons. We will show that like this is not a single neuromodulator system. There's a second neuromodulator adenosine, like uh, doing animal locomotion, that act on the adenosine receptor uh, and uh, result in robust PK activity during animal locomotion. Uh, and this uh, 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 this uh, our research team. All the work that I talk about is part of ongoing long-term collaboration with my colleague Penny Mouse Lab, and this uh, kind of lab outing, like uh, is the two lab uh, together. And people who contribute to the talk, uh, uh, directed to the talk today, are highlighted. And also for places like uh, who are hiring uh, faculties uh, this year, like uh, uh, my postdoc Lei is going into job market this year, and he will be a good candidate. Thank you very much. Yeah and I will take any questions. Great, thanks, Eileen. Yeah. Be beautiful snow mountains. Uh, now I'll open for questions. Uh, you know, I, is there a question in the chat? I lose my chat, okay. Just a second, no yet. Okay, just a second. Hey, honey. Hey, yeah. Aaron. Uh, great talk. Have you thought of using these these this um, sensor to look at situations of um, dopaminergic neuron degeneration and seeing if, if you detect early signs of disruptions to signaling? Uh, it looks like that your in vivo sensor setup now could be useful for that. Looking at, like models of Parkinson's. Yeah, I think like uh, that's a very good question. I think like uh, we are uh, we see like uh, there are many opportunities. I think like 
my lab has not really worked on a disease model in the past, but I, I wouldn't be surprised. Like really, like we made two, and then like we really uh, kind of try to enable kind of like the technical ability. And there are so many things to do. Really, like for what we can, for what we do, like we can only do a small part of it. Uh, and then like we are uh, we are very happy to share any of these uh, regions and know hows. And then like if anybody is interesting. Uh, in using in their system and their question, including yeah, uh, and then like uh, I think like we will be very ha happy to help. And in sorry, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, so yeah, I, I want to say that like uh, the mm -hmm. uh, lifetime imaging actually has a particular uh, advantage uh, in the context of a disease, because which actually is a very slow process. For example, like if you can imagine, like for example, if there's a very good calcium sensor. I will, like it will still have a hard time in monitoring like a uh, changes like uh, over days because uh, like uh, like uh, the signal can be affected by intensity and and uh, and uh, uh, and the expression of sensor and all that. But lifetime is uh, a property that is independent of uh, the number of molecules. So therefore, like a uh, uh, one can get a much more reliable readout mm -hmm. in that sense. Okay. Sorry, so. so uh... Uh, I was asking, I'm curious about so whether uh, so for the lifetime imaging PKA activity might also be implicated in the other you know, modulation, uh, like serotonin or even say um, oxytocin, right? So, it's, uh, so down, for downstream, how I, I, be, I believe there will be more further down compared to calcium signaling, right? When PKA acti activated the neural activity, maybe. So, so how, how, how do you speculate the PKA activity imaging will be? implicate the other new modulus and signaling? Okay, yeah, I, I think it's a very good question. Um, so uh, MP basically like is at the heart, but to a degree, yeah. calcium is the same thing, right? Like there are many different right. ways for one change the calcium dynamics. Yeah. Obviously the proper yeah. control, for example, certain pharmacology and, and other manipulation, and then one can dissect out whether calcium will come from one way or another. And we think mm -hmm. that the psych MP actually and PK is actually somewhat analogous situation in that like uh, uh, it's a hard for it, it has its own biology, it's important. And second is that like uh, by using proper pharmacology, such as uh, in our example in the striatum, that like with the pharmacology we actually uh, realized that like uh, it's likely to be mediated by adenosine and we went further ahead and used the adenosine sensor kind of to confirm. And then also like we also do many other pharmacology. And I think like uh, this actually to a degree is a uh, a strength of this sensor. And also uh, eventually, if you think about like there are so many different neuropeptides and then like um, mm -hmm. so many different different carbon receptors, it's probably not mm -hmm. quite possible to make a sensor for every single one of them. Right. And then starting with uh, so kind of a common hub and then like uh, and with pharmacology to the initial hint. And then I think like this uh, can probably like lead to many research avenues as well. And obviously like complement to like uh, uh, all those uh, new modulator sensors. Sure, sure, thanks. Uh, tai Chi, one, one, one more question. Please, can I ask yourself? Yeah, Hi, Hai Ying. Uh, hey. That's an interesting talk. I have a naive question, actually. So when you, uh, it's about the PK uh, uh, sensor. So um, when the uh, neurotransmission started, I mean the direct neurotransmission and the neuromodulation, neuromodulation sometimes they happen uh, simultaneously. Can the PK sensor uh, can show any difference in the kinetics of activation during this process? Uh, I think uh, that's a very good question. I think like uh, uh, this always, I think like uh, the PK sen the PK sensor like uh, is uh, the fastest we have measured like uh, is uh, at the order of uh, tens of seconds, right? So uh, so therefore like uh, whether it can follow kind of uh, kind of uh, uh, fast, like, but at the same time, like, we, we believe that, like, that reflects, uh, as I showed some of the examples, like, uh, we believe that reflects, like, the endogenous uh, kinetics of these second measuring pathways. And there are, like, all these Korean example, uh, like, uh, dopamine together with glutamate or dopamine together with GABA. And then, like, uh, they, they will just naturally work on very different uh, time scales and then, like, uh, uh, wear their own effectors, I think. Thank okay. you. Great. Um, if no more questions, I guess thanks, thanks Heidi, for great talks. Great. Yeah, yeah thank you. And, uh, thank you. And uh, open the next talk to Chen. Karen? Okay, thanks. Right. Awesome talk.
And um, our next speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce, is Shua Chan Ling. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Physiology at National University of Singapore. Um, Shua Chen um, received his undergraduate degree in the National Tsinghua University in Taiwan. Is that connected to the Tsinghua University in Beijing? Yeah. Somehow? Great. Okay, yeah, so yeah. great. <laughs> um, so that's the top university, um, Tsinghua University is the top university in China, so I wonder if they have another campus elsewhere. And then after graduating, he came to um, the States for his PhD, where he did a, a PhD in the University of Illinois. And here he studied um, transport of RNA protein granules. He used um, the fragile experimental retardation protein as um, a way of labeling these transport granules. And he used studies in Drosophila cells and um, to study roles of kinesin and dynein in transporting. He then came to uh, San Diego and he did a postdoctoral fellowship at UCSD with Don Cleveland. He worked on numerous ALS related projects, including, uh, I think he had like 20 papers or something like that as a postdoc, uh, at least 15. And then including um, important studies about mechanisms by which TV43 and FUS can um, cause disease. Um, he uh, had used uh, elegant transgenic mice that he developed to, to demonstrate ALS causing mutations in the FUS gene result in a toxic gain of function. And this has motivated clinical development and testing of ASOs to target this that have just now been administered to humans, which is inspiring. He wrote this really amazing review article on ALS mechanisms that's been cited like well over a thousand times. It's uh, sort of the key review article in, in our field. I think maybe my lab cited it at least 500 times. Um, and then in his own lab at Singapore, he continues to work on the cutting edge uh, in the ALS field. He's made uh, many important contributions to like virtually all of the major ALS genes, FUS, TP43, C9, ORF72. And he asks questions about the normal functions of genes, their role in disease, and um, looking forward to hearing his latest about TB43. Thank you, Aaron. That's incredibly generous of you uh, of the introductions. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shuqie Ling. Um, um, I, I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, I always think this is a great uh, platform headed by Aaron and Zilong. This, been fantastic and I learned a lot. And it's always very humbling and exciting to hear the talk. And I'm nervous because uh, there's a lot of giant, including Aaron in the, in the audience. So hopefully I will not uh, disappoint people. So, so for today, I will only focus on TDP's role uh, in, in one type of glia oligodendrocytes. Um, uh, without going too much introduction, very briefly, just to bring everyone to speed, uh, my lab study two disease, uh, adult onset neurodegenerative disease. One is AOS, predominantly affecting motor cortex and spinal cord, and FTD or frontal temporal dementia. By name, you will know that's uh, hitting the frontal lobe and, and temporal lobe. And correspondingly, uh, the phenotype or symptom in human are different. One is affecting motor function, one is affecting behavior and language function. The key feature in LS is degeneration of upper motor neuron in the motor cortex, lower motor neuron in the spinal cord. One of the key feature called lateral sclerosis basically means the uh, scarring of the uh, lateral colon in human, and that basically represent the degeneration of axons from upper motor neurons. The second key feature, as I mentioned, was the uh, degeneration of motor neuron plenty. Oh, maybe you cannot see my cursor, sorry. Uh, the uh, the motor neuron, you, oh, that's okay? Yep. Okay, the degeneration of motor neurons, uh, uh, drawing here that the, in the patients compared to controls. Uh, and that basically lead to loss of voluntary movements. Uh, on the other hand, FTD is the degeneration. What you can see here is a huge degeneration of the frontal lobe. And that is slightly distinct from Alzheimer's disease where the, the frontal lobe is largely spared and this is in the initial stage of Alzheimer's disease. 
the 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 now the AOS and FTD is now recognized. It is likely to be a spectral disease rather than two disease. And the reason, there are several reasons. One of which is a genetic mutation, as Aaron alluded to, and he also made a huge contribution on, on a lot of those genes. One of which is CNIO seventy two, which basically give it can give rise to AOS, FTD, or both. The gene that we particularly focus on are TDP43 in, in this case. And the reason we're particularly interested in TDP43 is when uh, clinicians look into uh, patients, in particularly by uh, Virginia Lee at UPenn, what they have discovered is TDP43 account for uh, over 90% uh, of AOS patients, and that basically lead to the recognition of TDP is in fact the hallmark of the disease. In FTD, FTD is intrinsically heterogeneous, and it account roughly 50% or 45% of patients has TDP43 inclusion. So for this reason, my lab is very interesting in understanding the role of TDP43. What is TDP43? It's, it's our DNA RNA by proteins, has two RNA recognition motif, R and one and two. It also has a low complexity prion-like domain. And in particular, the majority of mutation that is linked to LS and FTD is cl clustered within this domain. And that suggests to us that dysfunction in TDP is able to trigger disease cascade. The second, uh, a very peculiar uh, pathology discovery is TDP43 normally is in the nucleus. However, in disease condition, this is showing you a sporadic cases in LS. There's a loss of TDP with the same time redistribution of cytosolic TDP43. And the same phenomena, this uh, particular uh, this redistribution is recapitulated with a patient carry uh, AOS mutations. The TD, basically the distribution of TDP is, is lost, the nuclear TDP is lost. This, uh, this suggests to us that regardless the cause, it's likely the pathogenic process is somehow converged on TDP43 since it represents the majority of the cases. But secondly, based on this uh, redistribution, and we can also assume both gain and all loss might contribute or dry disease pathogenesis. And the last point, what I want to make is this TDP uh, proteinopathy is also prevalent in other new neurodegenerative disease. I think now has been recognized that it's also uh, present in Alzheimer's disease. And these are some of the references. With that being said, when TDP43 was first then rediscovered by Virginia Lee as a coma for TDP43, a lot of group around the world is trying to understand what does this protein do? And Essentially, as an RNA binding protein, it's almost involved in every step of RNA processing. This includes transcription, splicing regulations, uh, translation, and so on. And I just want to point out is also involved in transcription and translation, which will come back a little bit. The discovery from uh, Field One's group at Johns Hopkins further identified TDP43 is important for quick exon regulation, which Aaron also had the beautiful paper on nature describing uh, the TDP43's role on, on 13 quick exon usages. In, in short, what, what people think is happening is TDP43 basically block uh, the, the exon recognition domain by which the loss of TDP then would lead to inclusion of the exon and not typically lead to uh, nonsense media decay of the um, target RNA. TDP also has been shown to be involved in DNA damage response. So in, in all, TDP seem to play a, a really many roles in, in cells. So, I want to then step back to go back to the pathological HOMA. So it is recognized TDP43 is a HOMA in motor neurons. But early on, people also noticed that 
the pathology also can be found in smaller cells likely to be astrocyte. And, and to further uh, prove this point that then this group used a uh, phospho TDP, which you can uh, equate uh, to um, uh, uh, pathologic TDP43, they were able to co-localize with oligodendrocyte marker. Then this also suggests TDP aggregate can found in astrocyte oligodendrocyte. And in fact, if you look at TDP43 expression, this is the data set from Ben Berry's uh, data set looking at different cell type uh, uh, expressions. And I, I think you can, we all can appreciate TDP43, in fact, is ubiquitously expressed in astrocyte neurons, oligodendrocyte lineage, microglia, and so on, so, and so on. So, and again, this is also a hallmark for a lot of neuron degenerative disease, all these genes are ubiquitously expressed. They are not unique to neuron. So the question then becomes, what are the function of TDP in different glia? And whether TDP 43 mediate damage within glia actually contribute to, to new degeneration. And this is what then my group set up trying to answer. So for the purpose of this talk, oops. Uh, what I will only focus is one of the effort that we trying to do is to delete TDP43 using conditional allele. This was first made by Phil Wan and Hopkins, cross to CMP Cree, where Cree is knocking in the endogenous CMP promoter. CMP is the, one of the most abundant gene within oligodendrocyte. So this should mimic the endogenous expression pattern of CMP. Immunofluorescence here showing you the red is labeled uh, with TDP, the green is CC1, a marker for mature oligodendrocyte, and you can appreciate the loss of TDP specifically from the oligodendrocyte, but not other neighboring cells. What we found essentially is TDP deletion lead to napatosis of mature oligodendrocyte. And more interestingly, oligodendrocyte precursor cell known of OPCs was able to uh, basically regenerate, proliferate, and then replenish the loss of mature oligodendrocyte within the white matter. But in gray matter, this, they show an age-dependent uh, loss capacity for regeneration, and that basically lead to reduction of mature oligodendrocyte in the, in the gray matter specifically. And furthermore, we also identify, or based on our clip seed data before, it seemed like TDP also regulate a mining nation by binding to mining related genes. So this was the conclusion at the time when we were analyze the mice, but we were kind of unsatisfied the, the uh, explanation. And we think there's probably more uh, is caused by TDP 43 as the, as what I mentioned to you, TDP plays so many functions. So then what we then do is, at the, this is a couple of years ago, then we did a very you know, uh, unbiased approach uh, looking at RNA-seq. And very talented bioinformatician, Kenan Ning was then able to deduce from the RNA-seq data, we zoom, he zooming on cholesterol biosynthesis, especially on SIEBF. Uh, SIEBF. So, Maybe let me step back and just have one slide of uh, in introduction on cholesterol metabolism. So I, I think many of us know uh, brain accounts for 2% body weight, but 25% of cholesterol is found in the brain. Within the brain, 75% of cholesterol is in fact in the mining sheet, which is not surprising because this is a lipid rich uh, environment. What is important to know is because blood brain barrier, essentially the, the cholesterol from the peripheral and the CNS actually do not cross to each other. And there, thereby all the cholesterol within CNS is thought to only come from de novo synthesis within CNS. And, and the two cell that is likely, two cell type that is likely to produce the predominant 
cholesterol is exercising oligodendrocyte. I think for obvious, for probably for oligodendrocytes, probably very obvious because the myelin sheet. Furthermore, I think many of you also know this: uh, the the cholesterol made by astrocyte is is has to be transported to other cell, and this is likely through a poly-mediate uh, transport process, and then also through through LDLR, which is low density lipoprotein receptor. This can then move around to different cell types. And this is a phenomenon calling as horizontal cholesterol trans transport. So the question then for us is to then uh, trying to understand how TDP43 regulate cholesterol homeostasis in the CNS. So that then we went back to this SIBF2. SIBF2, this work from Brown and Goldstein at UT, UT Southwestern beautifully illustrate this feedback mechanism where SIBF2 uh, it synthesizes as an ER protein. When so, what we what we also show here is TDP forty three indeed bind to SIBF two. This is the clip uh, cross linking uh, immune presentation showing TDP forty three bind to SIBF two pre RNA. This is the RNA seq trait showing you the reduction of S SIBF two selectively. Uh, in the knockout mice. SIBF2, as I mentioned, it, it synthesizes precursor resides in the ER. When the cholesterol level is low, uh, the, this uh, SIBF2 together with SCAP, a binding a partner of SIBF2, will be translocated to Golgi, where it goes through two sequential proteolytic processing to release the N-terminal transcription domain, and then subsequently will act will activate cholesterol uptake and by synthesis. What we then see from our RNA seq data, this is looking at 20 days and 60 days. 20 days is where the mice has no uh, strong symptoms, while by 60 days, the mice start to die. In the red bar, uh, the, the, the black bar are the control mice, uh, the blue bars are heat heterozygous knockout mice, where the TDP level is the same as the wild type mice. And then the, the red is uh, CKO mice, the conditional knockout mice, where you, I, I hope you can appreciate the progressive uh, downregulation of SIEBF2, why the rest of the gene appear to be unchanged. Then what we then do is then draw out uh, all the cholesterol biothensetic enzyme together also with the uptake uh, receptor as mentioned here, because uh, the de novo synthesis and uptake are basically two way for the cell to get cholesterol. And, and this again, using the work from Brown and Goldstein lab, where we, we basically denoted what are SIBF2 targets. But interestingly, what we also found is TDP43 often bind to the same target that regulate by SIBF2. So for example, here I show you one of the red limiting enzyme for, for the whole class of biosynthesis or HNGCR, where TDP43 indeed bind to HNGCR and then in the conditional Naga mice, it's the, the expression is reduced. And that is also true for LDLR where there's a binding and then together there's reduction when TDP43 is knocked down. Furthermore, we look at all the pathway, what we also realize basically the whole uh, cholesterol biosynthesis and uptake pathway are basically reduced with uh, in the oligodendrocyte deletion mice in the HD dependent manner. Then subsequently, again, for the interesting of time, I'm now going to all, uh, with all the data, suffice to say, we have used multiple assay to make sure SIBF2 or LDLR both RNA level and the protein level is reduced using QRT-PCR RNA fish immunofluorescence, both in vivo in mice and in vitro in the primary uh, oligodendrocyte cultures. The question is how exactly TDP affect uh, SIBF2? So for this, I also uh, just going to show you one essay that we did, which basically to look at the transcription uh, rate of SIBF2. The reason we look at transcription rate is when we do QRT-PCR, we realize RNA level is down. 
But when we check half life of SIBF2 and LDLR, it does not appear TDP regulating the half life. To explain that, we then basically go, we thought that one possibility is maybe the transcription is reduced. In this case, we use an essay that this developed uh, 12, 13 years ago using basically DRB that block the active transcription. Essentially, when you treat cell with DRB, it will hold polymerase two in the transcription staff site while allowing all uh, the remaining transcription to be uh, completed. What we then can do is basically to wash out the RB and then let the transcription start. Then we can then use primer to look at exon one, ex, exon intron junctions to ask what are the transcription rate of this newly synthesized mRNA. So this is basically work done by a postdoc in my lab that's an he basically then do exactly this treatment as I mentioned to you. What he then realized, you can see the blue is a control SIRNA and red is TDP43 knockdown. What you can see is once the RB is washed out, SIBF2 transcription can come back. But in, in this case, uh, when TDP43 is knocked down, SIBF2 transcription remain low. That means it's, it's somehow regulating transcription start. And that the same phenomena can also seem uh, using LDLR mRNA. Uh, again, we, because the transition of time, we also do a pure mycin uh, assay where we also found that the translation for uh, this LDLR is also affected. So what we think is TDP43 regulate SIBF2 and LDLR expression likely through both transcription and translations. Then what we would then want to come back and then uh, want to really link the classroom metabolism with the myelination phenotype. So for this, Jolie Hall, uh, a, a, a research assistant at the time then culture a primary oligodendrocyte using immunopending methods. And basically then she then subsequently follow up with standing for TDP43, SIBF2 and MBP which mining basic protein might mark uh, mining nation step of uh, oligodendrocyte. And here showing when TDP43 is deleted, SIBF2 is reduced. And that subsequently correlate with MBP uh, reduce MBP, or what we then interpret as a demyelination phenotype. But here we have a conundrum here, because what I just show you is TDP43 is able to bind to SIBF2 together with cholesterol by synthesis and import. But this is the exact the same target SIBF2 is regulating. So who is you know, regulating who and what is the main driver on the whole process? So for this one, we, we put TDP upstream and then therefore our thinking is maybe SIBF2 are the main driver rather than TDP. So if that's the case, then what we should be able to rescue with as in the knockdown of TDP43 and try to rescue with SIBF2 or even just LDLR to make sure that the cell can import cholesterol and whether this can rescue cholesterol level. We then use a, a flipping, which is an antibiotic that binds to cholesterol uh, and give us the assay. So here basically, again, showing you that cholesterol level is reduced upon TDP43 uh, re uh, knockdown. When we put by SIBF2, we can rescue the level and the rescue also can be done by simply putting back LDLR. And we also use a biochemical assay to measure cholesterol directly. Again, you can see a, a, about 20% reduction of cholesterol and then rescued by SIBF2 and LDOR. And lastly, what we want to do is if the demyelination phenotype is caused by, um, uh, <laughs> is caused by reduction of cholesterol, then we should be able to rescue the phenotype by putting back cholesterol. So in, in this, we use beta-cyclic death strain uh, with cholesterol complex. 
And again, with the thing that I show you previous, the immune forces picture that I showed you previously, uh, we could in fact rescue at this partially MBP uh, as, as shown here. So TDB43 remain to be re, uh, knocked out. And then this is MBP standing, and this is basically showing the, the, the rescue effect. And going a bit over time, but essentially what then what we want to then propose this model is basically when TDP43 is knocked out as IBF2 is reduced, and this basically lead to demyelination phenotype. Um, I, I think some of you then might ask, so what is this actually relevance to human disease? So for this, we then was very pleased to read the paper from Eddie Lee uh, at UPenn, where he then discovered there's a subgroup of patient in FTD, where in this FTD patient, they show TDP43 pathology in oligodendrocyte. So we then ask, is cholesterol metabolism also occur? Uh, this metabolism also occur in those uh, FTD patients. For this AD uh, then help us to stand this, his uh, patient tissues with TDP43. So here I just want to highlight, so no, if there's an oligodendrocyte without TDP43 pathology, you can see HNGC are standing. But when there's a TDP43 pathology, basically HNGC are expression is reduced. So this then suggests to us, indeed what we uncover might be relevant to disease. But one of the surprise can is when, when Eddie looking at LDLR, he found that in fact a co-aggregate co between TDP43 and LDLR. But nevertheless, uh, what we then want to conclude is uh, TDP43 regulate SIBF2 cholesterol metabolism, and this is essential for myelination. And cholesterol dysmetabolism uh, should be considered, uh, it might contribute to TDP protein apathy disease. So I think I probably will end here. I just want to then say with collaboration with uh, Zhang Rabbits, a good friend and colleague of mine at UCSD, we were then able to reproduce the same phenotype we see uh, of TDP43 pathology with LDLR. So this I will just skip over uh, and just want to end here to then say one more thing with also with the interest of time, I did not go through all our work on astrocyte and swan cell. Swan cell is collaboration uh, with the work uh, with Jonah Chen and UCSF. Essentially, what I want to put forth is again, to go back to this idea that although we all focus on neurodegeneration, but in, in the nervous system, we all know it's in all cells are involved. And when TDP43 is deleted from different cell type, it typically actually give rise to very distinct phenotype among different cells. And I just want everyone to keep in mind because this will probably help us to understand the pathologic homa uh, for TDP43. And finally, I, I, I just want to acknowledge people who actually do the work uh, that oligodendrocyte deletion was initiated by Wang Jia, former PhD student. And most of the uh, oligo primary oligodendrocyte work is done by Jolie Ho and with help from Zetan. And again, we're very grateful to all great collaborator, most of them I mentioned along the way. Uh, uh, again, I, then I will end here and happy to take any questions that you might have. Sorry, I run a bit over time. Thanks, Shuochen, great talk. And um, we have time for questions. There's one um, in the chat that was sort of a General question: Do you do you think that about ALS? Do you think the degeneration of spinal motor neurons is caused, or partially caused by the degeneration of upper axons, or are they independent? That's a very good question. I think this is probably debate, right? People still think was it dying bag, or I guess I would probably say it might be of the above. It might be independent, it might be similar. Because in patient, you do see different representation. So it might be hard to, to 
decipher, I think. Maybe Aaron okay. has his thought. <laughs> oh, maybe. Uh, oh, Aristolina, do you have a question? Yeah, sorry. Um, thank you very much, hey, Aaron. Aristolina. Pleasure to uh, hear your talk. It's kind of nice. Uh, reminds me of the days when we were in the lab together. So, but don't you think there has to be some stochastic event because I mean, these all can happen in all of the cells, right? But what makes a certain region more prone um, for TDP43 loss of function to occur in, let's say, oligodendrocyte versus an astrocyte versus microglia? I mean, what are those stochastic events? Are they like, um, I mean, I'm just thinking out loud, but if you can help me <laughs> like continue the thought, I'll be very happy, yeah. Those questions are best discussed over, you know, over alcoholic alcohol. beverage. <laughs> that 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 is good for you know that the imagination run wide. No, I we do not know. Uh, all we know, I mean, this also not oh, not only us, right? I mean, there's if you look at transcriptomic signature, essentially they are all very different, right? Different brain region, I think. Now with all the single cell sequencing and so on and so forth, we probably can have a map to understand the region differences. And hopefully that will be one step closer to understand, you know, what are the events that lead into this. And it's incredibly complex. I mean, this the best is to really have a bunch of us in the room and then we just talk and chat and, and figure things out, I think. I don't have an answer for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Aaron, what do you think? Um, well, I'm sort of a, this is kind of re related. Uh, yeah, I do think everything is, it seems complicated if all cell types are being affected at the same time and all targets. Um, I was just wondering, Shua Chen, there's sort of some stuff emerging from human genetics studying studies using Mendelian randomization that's pointed to um, high levels of HDL cholesterol as being a, they even say causally, a causal relationship to ALS. Um, and how does that fit in with your finding of TDP43 regulating this pathway? So if my understanding is correct, so so basically my my understanding from those patient data uh, are the following. So indeed the back cholesterol or the, the LDL uh, cholesterol is a predictor of disease. This is this is probably universal. It said it's bad. It doesn't matter which disease, it's just bad for ALS. I think the work from Brian Trainers and, and the, the group at Sweden. It seems very, it, it seems convincing, but the situation changed when the, the patient was diagnosed uh, with ALS. The situation changed, uh, it now flipped the other way around. Patient with high cholesterol, now is saying the patient already have ALS. The, then if they have high cholesterol, it, it actually had better prognosis. And, and so, yes, it's bad, it's a predictor it's, that was, was before you get disease. But once you get disease, it seems like it, it might be better to have high cholesterol. But I think this remains to be tested at this in the mouse model and, and see. Got it. I, I, I hope that address your questions. Okay. Any other questions for Shua Chen? Okay, thanks. Awesome, really awesome work. And um, yeah, I'll see, we'll see everyone. Yeah, thanks, Ajahn. Next thanks, week. Thanks, Ajahn. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. That's so exciting. Great talks. Thanks. Yeah, awesome. Good talk. Thanks, Ajahn. Hi, Aaron. See you next week. All right. See you. Bye. Bye, guys. See you.